evening. Welcome to the Hemophilia Federation of America's Blood Brotherhood and Families Program webinar. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Lauren Nybert, HFA's Program Director. Also on the line tonight, we have HFA's Program Coordinator, Carrie Koenig, and HFA's Communication Manager, Sandra Wilkes. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few helpful webinar tips. Tonight's webinar will last approximately one hour. We certainly welcome your participation and questions during the webinar. However, your audio will be muted during the entirety of the webinar as this helps in the background noise that may disrupt the presentation. If you have a question, we encourage you to type a question into the question box at the bottom of your control panel. I will then pass your questions along to our speakers. Each of they would also like to thank Baxalta, now part of Shire, CDC Collaborative Partners, Genentech, and Acredo for their support of the Blood Brotherhood Program. And Noble Nordisk, Bayer, CDC Collaborative Partners, Genentech, and Acredo for their support of the Families Program. They help make these webinars possible. So tonight's presentation is On the Horizon, Emerging Therapies for Bleeding Disorders. We have two extremely knowledgeable speakers tonight, Dr. Bobby Duke Trans and Dr. Robert Sidonio. Dr. Bobby Tran is an adult hematologist at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. He obtained his medical degree at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina, and completed his internal medicine residency at the University of South Florida in Tampa. He subsequently completed his fellowship in hematology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and has joined the faculty caring for adult patients with bleeding disorders. Dr. Tran is an active clinical researcher in the field of hemophilia and bleeding disorders. He is particularly interested in patient-centered outcomes research in the bleeding disorders community. Dr. Robert Sidonio attended medical school at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, completed pediatric residency training at the University of Louisville, and his pediatric hematology oncology fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Sidonio is currently the Associate Director of Hemostasis and Thrombosis at Emory University at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. His research is focused on the diagnosis and management of adolescents and young adult women with bleeding disorders. Finally, we just want to remind everyone as well that this webinar is for educational purposes only and is not intended to be construed as direct medical advice, so please do discuss with your healthcare provider regarding your own individual treatment plan. And with that, we can go ahead and get started with our webinar. Dr. Tran and Dr. Sidonio, I'll let you take it from here. So good evening. Uh, this is Robert Sidonio on behalf of uh, Dr. Tran. Uh, we're happy to be talking to you today about emerging therapies for bleeding disorders. I will take the first portion of the uh, webinar and cover emicizumab and fituzarin, and Dr. Tran will cover the remaining part uh, focusing on gene therapy, TSPI drugs, and other emerging therapies. Uh, here listed are our disclosures from involvement in investigator-initiated studies and trials and uh, current uh, grants that we hold. Next slide. So today we have two simple objectives. The first one is to discuss novel therapies and their mechanisms of action for hemophilia that are currently within clinical trials. Uh, and we're also going to discuss the targeted patient populations for these emerging novel therapies. Next slide. So this is a picture of a purple petunia. We're going to talk about why this is important and what serendipitous uh, discovery was made uh, regarding this. Next slide. Before we get into that, we're going to have to um, cover some basic information, um, and I wanted to talk to you today before uh, so you can fully understand um, the subsequent drugs we'll talk about. So as most of you know, DNA, also called deoxyribonucleic acid, stores our genetic information. This is stored within the nucleus or the center of the cell as uh, pictured on there. Uh, you can see in there the genetic material is stored within the chromosomes in a double helix. Um, when, the, um, uh, when we need to convey the message, um, we use something called RNA or ribonucleic acid, which transports the DNA message from the nucleus to other parts of the cell. Because of that uh, mechanism, it's also called messenger RNA. Advance, please. And finally, protein, um, which are made up of amino acids, they are the ultimate, um, the, the final event that is needed um, uh, that is transmitted from DNA to RNA and forms the final product uh, of the proteins, most importantly and specifically to, uh, to you, factor eight and factor nine. Next slide. So um, within all of us, we have a certain security system. Uh, it's called RNA interference or RNAi henceforth. 
And what it does is it prevents viruses from entering our body and using our cells to create proteins. The viruses that we're commonly exposed to, particularly in this part of the, the, the season, uh, attempts to come in and use our body as a factory to manufacture more of the, of, of the viruses and ultimately just destroying the cell. Um, our body chops up this RNA, unwinds it, and binds it to other similar virus RNA blocking it from being made. So our body has created a certain security system. Um, because of this discovered security system, scientists have figured out what we can do to exploit this. So uh, because of this mechanism, we can actually introduce artificial RNA to come into the body, and what it, what it effectively will do is silence certain genes. So if you make a RNA that is complementary or the complete opposite pattern, uh, you inject it into the bloodstream, and it goes into the targeted location, in this point, the liver cell, we can actually tell the body to stop making that protein. So we can actually silence proteins like HIV proteins or cancer proteins or other proteins that are important in uh, the coagulation cascade. Next slide. What they didn't realize is when they did this, it created a white petunia. And what they realized was um, probably about a decade later, what happened was is that um, the body was recognizing those uh, extra genes that were taken into the cell, treated like viruses, and they were destroyed. Uh, what happened was is your body got, gets confused and also downregulates or destroys any other colors of genes, thus leading to a white petunia. So thankfully, we were able to discover this mechanism about 20 years ago and use it for our purposes. So I would uh, uh, re recommend reviewing this nice review article by Dr. Ragney, one of my former colleagues in New England Journal of Medicine. What we've learned is that some, there's evidence that some hemophiliacs that have a protein called antithrombin, when it's at low levels, they seem to have less bleeding. Um, and as you can see in the picture here um, on the left side, uh, certain factors are needed, uh, the most important being factor eight and nine. Uh, the ultimate goal is to form a thrombin or fibrin clot. Um, and there is a certain uh, protein called antithrombin, which serves as sort of a break uh, that slows down the clotting process. If we're able to reduce that antithrombin or remove our foot from the break, then we could actually form more thrombin even when there's low levels of factor eight or nine. Uh, what they have created was is a something called a small interfering RNA. They put a little tag uh, called a moiety on the end of it that goes directly to the hepatocytes or the livers, uh, to the liver. Uh, it's taken up, and uh, what happens is is your body is confused, ends up downregulating antithrombin. Um, and producing very low levels of this protein that's critical for blocking the formation of clots. Uh, as you can see here in the picture, uh, this medication has obvious uh, benefits because it can be given subcutaneously. Uh, it is delivered directly to the liver, uh, which is the site of antithrombin synthesis, and it harnesses the use of this mechanism called RNA interference. As you can see in the picture here on the right side, uh, when you have hemophilia, you don't produce appropriate uh, amounts of protein of factor eight or nine, and what you end up doing is uh, creating less thrombin. If you block that antithrombin that's uh, doing its job and trying to slow down clot production, you can actually form more clots uh, and uh, sort of obviate the need for or um, mitigate the issues that you have with low factor eight or nine. Um, some obvious things that I would like to point out. Uh, obviously, our current therapies are including uh, factor eight replacement therapy. Um, there's always the potential to induce factor eight inhibitors. Uh, they're not effective when, when you develop a neutralizing inhibitor. Uh, the current therapies are only given intravenous. It requires frequent dosing at least three times a week for hem severe hemophilia A and at least two times a week for severe hemophilia B. And it doesn't offer the stable protection levels with lots of peaks and troughs. Pituzarin theoretically uh, uh, could be used in patients with inhibitors and non-inhibitors. Um, there is no evidence that you would form an inhibitor to this protein because it is RNA, it is not factor eight or nine. Um, it would require less frequent dosing uh, as possibly up to every month, and it provides stable levels of protection by reducing the antithrombin levels. Um, it, it, it also has the, the benefits over a drug we'll talk about in a minute. Um, with by being effective in both hemophilia A and B patients. So briefly, we want to go through the different types of clinical trials because I think it's critical to understand that. 
Uh, if you're in a phase one trial, that's testing of a drug at different doses, either in healthy volunteers or patients. You're not looking at how well the drug works. You're really just looking um, that the drug is uh, able to be tolerated with, uh, with no issues with safety. When you're moving into phase two trials, you're starting to look at some efficacy because you want to see that the drug does have some effect, but also continue to have no safety issues. Most of the time in this phase, there's escalation of the dose to look for the appropriate dose that could be used in the subsequent phase or phase three trials, uh, in which uh, the most of the trials that we are discussing, uh, in which uh, the drug is actually tested against what's the standard of care, uh, which would be fetuserin versus the standard of care IV factor eight or ACE910 versus the standard of care IV factor eight. Um, I'm not going to go through all these things in the slides, but just understand that there are multiple parts to the phase one trial. They were looking at uh, multiple doses um, and then also look at different timing, whether it could be given on a weekly or monthly basis. So these things are all being done in preparation for the phase three trial that's going to be undergoing in the next couple of months. Um, so these are some of the results of the phase one trial. Um, and as you can see at the bottom there, there are 24 patients um, in the first bar there. Um, what they do that, it was they were looking at that as their reference. Um, as you lower the antithrombin, as you go from left to right, what you see is, is that the cumulative bleeds go from uh, 43 bleeds uh, when the antithrombin is not lowered appropriately, all the way to approximately three bleeds when it's lowered down to very low levels. And the annualized bleeding rate goes from 34 uh, per year to approximately six with plus or minus three. So we know that by lowering the antithrombin, we could reduce the amount of bleeds as evidenced by cumulative bleeds and by annualized bleeding rate. Um, here is the development plan for fetuserin. Um, they have conducted the phase one trials. And currently, uh, some of these numbers may change, um, but we, uh, we um, um, the last information that I've heard from the company is that the phase three trial and in inhibitors uh, the patients 12 and older will likely start uh, in the first quarter of 2017 and likely soon to follow will be the pediatric arm, which would be near and dear to my heart, of patients from age 2 to uh, 12. Um, and then there will be subsequent other studies in which they're looking at non-inhibitor. And there's some discussions about whether uh, in having a combined trial with non-inhibitor and inhibitor patients at the same time. Um, so we'll go through this trial very quickly, but this is the proposed trial the phase three stu a study in which you're looking at efficacy or how well it works. This will be in severe hemophilia A uh, and severe hemophilia B with inhibitors. Um, the primary objective will be to investigate how well fetuserin works at preventing bleeding episodes. The first trial, as in every hemophilia trial, will start off with patients 12 and older. Um, and they'll need to be patients, if they have an inhibitor, um, have to require bypassing agents for at least the six months prior to the screening period. There likely will be a lead-in period in which patients will be observed on their current bypassing agents, and then subsequently will be um, uh, put on fetuserin. Right now, the exact dose is not known. That's what the TBD stands for, to be determined. Um, and the primary endpoint of what they're going to be looking at are, is the annualized bleeding rate. And so patients that are on prophylaxis will get the drug immediately. They will not be randomized to no drug. And patients um, that are on on-demand in another trial may be randomized to not receive drug. But everybody at the end of the trial will be switched over and be able to be offered the drug uh, until it is potentially approved by the FDA. So let's move on to the next uh, exciting drug um, I want to talk about tonight. It has two names, ACE910 uh, and emicizumab. And what you're seeing here on the screen is, is the efficacy of the drug uh, or the mechanism of the drug. Um, on the top slide, at the top of the slide there, you see the normal uh, molecule of factor VIII and what it does on top of a platelet or phospholipid membrane. It brings together factor IX and factor X, combines it into a complex, and allows the coagulation or clotting cascade to occur, uh, so uh, thus forming a fibrin clot. Um, if you see below, they tried to simulate that and create a bispecific antibody or two parts of an antibody that can do the exact same thing that factor VIII does naturally. Um, and it uh, supports clotting cascade and formation of a clot. Um, uh, furthermore, it does not seem to interfere with your normal production of factor VIII, nor interfere with factor VIII that is infused. So again, looking at the benefits of this, um, 
um, when, when we're comparing from IV re replacement therapy, <clears throat> there is no potential for factor eight inhibitors again because this is an antibody. It is possible that you may develop a uh, anti-drug neutralizing antibody. This hasn't been seen so far in clinical trials. It will be effective for both inhibitor and non-inhibitor patients. And it also will be given subcutaneous route, which is obviously optimal for young children. There will be less frequent dosing, likely approximately once a week, and it will offer more stable levels of protection, similar to what we saw. And so you can see here illustrated, the factor eight naturally brings factor nine and 10 together, and emicizumab simulates that uh, same uh, concept and mechanism. So there are a couple of clinical trials that we'll go through here. Um, just for the sake of time, I'll go through this a little bit faster. Um, but the objectives are in a phase one trial to look at the safety and how well the drug does in the body and how well our body deals with the drug. Uh, the population is, as always, 12 and older. Uh, they were looking at annualized bleeding rates uh, as an endpoint, uh, more of a secondary endpoint. And they were looking at different doses. So if you look at the bottom there, there are three different cohorts or groups of patients in which they studied. Uh, 0.3 milligrams per kilo, 1 milligram per kilo, and 3 milligrams per kilo. Um, the important part of this is the safety results. Um, there were adverse events, and we use that term, it sounds worse than it is, but uh, patients will have mostly reported issues with site injection uh, redness. There's been only one patient that has remo been removed from trial in the first phase one and phase two trials uh, because of a local reaction, and these are things that would be seen with any kind of injection. Uh, most importantly, in the phase one and phase two trials, there have been no thrombotic events. Three patients have developed um, antibodies against the drug. None of them seem to have neutralized the effect. And there's been no change in clotting markers and no evidence of formation of clots um, by clotting markers. Uh, as you can see here, similar to what we sh showed in the um, uh, previous drug, if you look at the left side here, the median uh, annualized bleeding rate, um, as you move across, you can see that the annualized bleeding rate in the different patient populations, uh, different patients uh, went from on average of 30, 32 in all to 1.7 following uh, introduction of the drug. When you looked at joint bleeding, on average they were having 27 joint bleeds um, per year uh, according to this one patient, and it was reduced to 1.7. As you move from left to right, the drug dose increases, and so the, uh, what you can see here is that the annualized bleeding rate goes down to approximately zero, uh, and patients were able to go for prolonged periods of time without any significant bleeding. Um, again, evidence on, this, uh, on these slides here. I know it's a busy slide, but if you start on the left side where the inhibitors are, you can see the escalating doses here as evidenced by the blue, white, and teal bars. And as you increase the dose, the annualized bleeding rates went down, which is what we want. We want very low bleeding rates. Uh, and in the non-inhibitor patients, as you increase the doses, it even had a better effect with a 100% reduction in um, bleeding e episodes. Um, and this was seen over long periods of time. It's important to note that both of these drugs do not affect the inhibitor level, and they're both not intended to get rid of the inhibitor and are not there to replace immune tolerance. Um, but what we're trying to do is to bypass the inhibitor and hopefully make the inhibitor irrelevant. Um, the uh, trial that is uh, currently uh, completed enrollment was one in ad adolescent and adult inhibitor patients, the BH2-8884, and what it's looking at is it look, it's looking for patients with, that are 12 and older with severe hemophilia A that have a history of high titer inhibitors, five or higher, um, that are off immune tolerance. So these patients had to be off of their immune tolerance regimen for approximately at least 24 weeks and require a bypassing agent. So. Uh, recombinant factor seven or uh, FIBA or factor eight inhibitor bypassing agents. They were looking for the number of bleeds over time. And this study, if you were on um, episodic use of factor or episodic use of a bypassing agent, you were either randomized to the drug or no drug, but eventually you would switch over to receive the drug. If you were on prophylactic FIBA or Nova 7, you went straight in to receive the drug uh, and can be offered to stay on the drug. The next study um, that we'll be opening very soon is uh, the use of an adolescent and adult non-inhibitor patients. So it's a similar setup uh, in which 12 patients 12 and older with severe hemophilia A and no history of inhibitors um, will be on here. You have to have good documentation of bleeding in the previous 24 weeks and no history of immune tolerance. And what they'll be doing is looking at the number of bleeds over time. 
There are different uh, dosing regimens. All of them start with a loading dose of three per kilo, uh, eventually moving to a maintenance dose, and then the, uh, the study allows you to titrate the dose to a certain amount of annualized bleeding rate. The next study that has had uh, currently on temporary enrollment and will resume in December of 2016, most of the sites have been offered to enroll one patient, uh, and there are, I believe, two sites or three sites that have been offered to continue to enroll. The objective of this one is, again, to look at safety, efficacy, and the pharmacokinetics of the drug. Um, they will be enrolling patients uh, less than 12 years of age. They are looking for approximately 20 to 30 inhibitor patients um, and um, with a history of a high titer inhibitor. They have to be off immune tolerance uh, and factor. Um, they do not need to be off for a long period of time like in the previous uh, um, trial in which they had to be off for, for 24 weeks. Um, they will be looking at um, patients less than two as well once they get a certain amount of information from those patients that are 2 to 12 years old. Um, and so currently there are a few sites enrolling. Our site is enrolling one patient uh, and hopefully by December we'll be, it'll be opened up for everybody else to continue to enroll. So uh, at this point I'll turn it over to my colleague Dr. Tran and I'll be advancing the slide. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks Dr. Spadonio. So the first um, trial that I'll be talking about is Consosuzumab, which is uh, made by Novo Nordisk. And what this is is it's actually a humanized monoclonal antibody created against TFPI. So what TFPI stands for is tissue factor pathway inhibitor, and TFPI is a potent inhibitor of the uh, initiation pathway of clot formation, and it actually inhibits, inhibits tissue factor in two steps. The first step is that it binds to the active site of factor 10A, and it inhibits the protolytic capacity of factor 10A. Uh, then there's also the inhibition of the tissue factor and factor 7A complex. Now, if we block the TFPI, then this actually increases hemostasis. And in mouse models, uh, with TFPI knocked out, bleeding was reduced significantly. So with this trial, um, Novo Nordis reported results of the phase one trial in 2015 using healthy and also uh, individuals with hemophilia. They tested out the administration method of the consistuzumab using IV and also uh, sub-Q injections uh, to reduce the TFPI levels. They noted that with the IV administration, uh, they were able to reduce the TFPI levels for greater than 30 days, and whereas with the sub-Q injections, they were able to uh, reduce the levels for 14 to 20 days. Um, they also noted in their uh, in their results that there was no serious adverse event, uh, but there was one superficial thrombophlebitis that was reported in a healthy male. Uh, although this trial was completed in uh, 2000 or even though this trial has already been completed, there are other trials looking at uh, ways to manipulate the TFPI pathways uh, to gain hemostasis that I'll mention later on in my presentation. The next topic that I'll talk about is gene therapy. And this is a very exciting thing that uh, we've heard about for many years. And uh, to kind of understand it a little bit better, you have to know that hemophilia is caused by mutations in either the factor eight or factor nine gene. Um, and then the overall idea is to somehow get a specific viral vector, which is essentially a shell that will carry the corrected gene into uh, the patient's body. The specific viral vectors that have been used and have been tested are called adeno-associated virus, and I'll abbreviate that as AAV, but there's uh, either one through eight different uh, types of vectors. And then uh, they are, what the vectors are doing is they're carrying the corrected gene and incorporating it into uh, the patient's DNA in order to start making appropriate factor eight and factor nine levels. Now, the corrected gene, uh, there are certain types of corrected genes that different uh, companies have been trying to work with. One is the wild-type gene, 
which is the uh, regular gene. And then there's also a special version um, of these genes, such as the Padua variant. And what the Padua variant is, is specifically talking about uh, factor 9. And this was found in an individual that uh, he had this variant of the factor 9 gene that was actually hyperactive. And he was making over 700% of the normal clotting um, amount. And so they have used this uh, in some of the studies in order to produce a stronger effect. Now, animal studies uh, have shown long-term expression. But when it came to human trials, um, the therapeutic effects were shown to be only temporary uh, because of immune responses that had developed in humans but not previously seen in animals. And gene therapy uh, started back in, started curing uh, canines actually back in the 1990s. Uh, and then it wasn't until the mid-2000s that they recognized that the human trials were being undone by uh, the immune reaction uh, that had never been seen before. And so in 2010, researchers at the University College of London and St. Jude's Hospital started using um, special or using time doses of immune suppressing agents in order to manage this effect. Uh, next slide. The main methods of gene delivery are either the direct method where uh, they just put the gene inside the viral shell, and then they inject it directly into the patient. Or the other method is to put the gene inside the viral shell and then incorporate it into uh, some stem cells, which are, which are often derived from the patient. And then once they have multiplied this in the laboratory, then they re-administer it into the patient. Next. So these are some. Uh, gene therapy studies that you probably have heard about, but they are currently not enrolling. Uh, the BACS 355 uh, used the, uh, this was looking at the po patient population of individuals with hemophilia B. They used the AAV8 vector and the factor 9 Padua variant. Um, this had some promising results, but uh, according to Shire, who has now taken over uh, Axalta, they are not going to proceed with this uh, study. The other one is the BMN270 uh, by Biomarin. And this uh, group actually looked at treating severe hemophilia A patients. Um, and they presented their results at WSH, uh, but right prior to that, they actually um, had suspended their study for further enrollment at this time. And it's unclear at this point whether they may open it again up at a later time. So as far as the ones that are currently enrolling in gene therapy, there is the AMT060 uh, by Unicure, and also the SPK9001 by Spark, as well as the DTX101 by Dimension Therapeutics. And all of these are looking at the patient population of hemophilia B individuals. And as you can see there in the brief descriptions, uh, they use different types of the AAV vectors as well as the different type of uh, factor IX gene. Now, whether the factor IX Padua or the wild type is more effective, um, the long-term results are unclear. Today, I'll be focusing on discussing the AMT060 and the SPK9001 uh, with the results, with interim results, uh, because DTX101 is currently enrolling, but there's no prelim results that are available. So the AMT060 uh, by Unicure also presented their uh, interim uh, update at uh, WFH this year. Next slide, please. So the uh, AMT060 uses the AAV5 capsid as their uh, carrier shell. And then they use the human wild type uh, factor 9 gene uh, inside there. 
They additionally have added a LP1, which is a liver-specific promoter, to help uh, guide this mainly into the liver. And these patients were uh, infused with this medication, and it was a one-time 30-minute IV infusion where they were kept in the hospital and observed for uh, 24 hours. And they had chosen the AAV5 because there was high liver tropism um, and then also had been shown in other clinical trials, uh, long-term uh, safety in those with uh, acute intermittent porphyria, which is another blood condition. And this was also the least homologous with the other AAVs. Uh, additionally, the AAV5 also has low seroprevalence, which means that they had low pre-existing anti-AAV5 neutralizing antibodies uh, in the general population. The gene that they used was the same gene that uh, was used in the studies with St. Jude, and um, this has demonstrated a long-term uh, safety profile as well as durable gene expression. The, uh, this trial has five individuals that uh, received the, in this first cohort, uh, they had five individuals who received uh, five times 10 to the 12 GCs per kg as their dose. Um, the next cohort, where they have an escalated dose, uh, they are likely going to try to open up that uh, study at the end of 2017. Next. As you can see here, uh, these are the individual, or these are the uh, composite factor IX activities over time after uh, they were infused with the medication. And there was a mean factor IX activity up to 39 weeks of 5.4%. Uh, and when you're looking at the individual patient uh, on the next slide, you'll see that there are actually four out of five uh, after receiving the AMT-060, maintain a level of factor IX activity between 3 and 7 percent at week 39. And this resulted in discontinuation of factor IX prophylaxis in these four individuals. Uh, and there's also no evidence of uh, development of inhibitor at this time. There were a couple of adverse uh, events. One was a uh, trans amenitis, which is an elevation of the liver enzymes, uh, and then this was treated with uh, steroids, which has uh, been able to slowly decrease it. And then the other was a self-limited fever within the first 24 hours of uh, administration of the AMT-060. Uh, but there's been so far no evidence of um, sustained AAV5 capsid uh, specific T cell activation. And then, um, as expected, all of the patients developed an anti-AAV5 antibody after week one, and uh, none of them have developed a factor IX inhibitor. And the next gene therapy trial uh, for hemophilia B is the SPK9001. And how they, what they did was they used a uh, novel bioengineered AAV capsid um, that they named SPARK100. And they also um, have used, they started with a low starting dose of 5 times 10 raised to the 11th uh, VG for KG. Next. Uh, and what you can see on this slide is that they've been able to uh, demonstrate consistent and sustained levels of factor IX activity to about 31.8 percent, plus or minus 0.9 percent in uh, the individuals that have been enrolled in this. And uh, next slide. You can see that uh, the this drug has been well tolerated, and uh, these individuals also had no need for regular factor infusions or immunosuppression. Next. On, uh, this is one of the studies that SBK has actually has uh, in preclinical um, studies right now, 
and it's currently not enrolling right now, but uh, they had made mention of this, and they're likely to try to uh, initiate phase one, phase two trials either later this year or early 2017. Next. So some of the challenges to uh, gene therapy still remain. Um, specifically, if we're talking about hemophilia A individuals, um, the factor eight DNA is actually very large, the gene is very large. And so it has to be compressed and optimized to fit into uh, a virus vector. The factor eight gene is about six times the length of uh, factor nine, so it makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, and then also trying to maintain a sustained long-term expression is another challenge. Um, and then also just trying to get the lowest dose possible because the lowest dose decreases the risk of an immune response. And then another gene therapy challenge is just trying to get consistent results uh, for all those treated and one of the last ones is, one of the last challenges is to uh, decrease the immune response to the AV capsids um, because the immune response can cause transaminitis uh, or liver inflammation. So on the next slide, I have included other uh, notable drugs that are currently um, enrolling in clinical trials right now. I have, some of them are, in, are enrolling only in Europe. Uh, and I've included those in there. Uh, next slide. And then here are a couple of other studies as well that are currently enrolling. Next slide. But for the uh, most up-to-date information, as Dr. Sidonio mentioned, uh, you should go to clinicaltrials.gov, and depending on um, your diagnosis, you can type in the different specifics to see if you meet criteria for any of the uh, current trials that are being offered. And with that, I will conclude my part. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Tran and Dr. Sidonio. Um, so if you have any questions, please go ahead and type those questions into the question box at this time. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. So the first one is, if you have a positive inhibitor and are using ACE 910, how do you measure factor activity levels to determine dosing of bypassing agents if you do have a bleed? So uh, this is Dr. Sidonia. So uh, per the clinical trials uh, in the studies that they are enrolling patients with inhibitors, the uh, patients are to be getting uh, ACE 910 on a weekly basis uh, injected subcutaneously, and that was that the, the, the purpose of that is to prevent any bleeding, hopefully reducing the bleeding down to a very small amount. Uh, when there is an acute bleed, um, we, you are to use the previously used bypassing agent that you feel that you were, uh, responded better to, whether that's recombinant factor seven or uh, factor eight inhibitor bypassing agent or FIBA, and you would dose it at a similar dosing regimen that you did before. So, for, for example, at our institution, if you are a, a patient that has a high titer inhibitor, you enrolled on the study, we would uh, infuse you with FIBA uh, twice a day if you had an acute bleed uh, until there's resolution, uh, and then uh, once there's resolution, stop the FIBA and continue to use the ACE 910 um, as the maintenance drug to prevent bleeding. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, uh, with cetuserin, what is the potential damage to the liver because of the alteration of antithrombin? So um, there, there is always that potential. So far in the early phase trials, there has been no alteration or significant elevation of the liver enzymes. There have been no significant changes in markers that would indicate that um, there's a concern for a DVT or deep vein thrombosis. Uh, and so uh, the way that they've created this drug is they put a small uh, part of a molecule called a moiety at the end that goes directly to the liver, or preferentially goes to the liver. Uh, it is taken up by the liver, uh, and its sole purpose is to go in specifically and uh, knock down that one specific protein. 
They haven't seen any alterations in the ability for the liver to form other proteins that are critical for survival. Uh, and the way they created this, it's really, um, they made it where it's complementary or the exact opposite of the target, which is antithrombin. And so it doesn't seem to be overlapping with any other proteins. Uh, and so far, no evidence that it's interfering with any other processes. So it really is a sort of uh, like a, a sort of like a scud missile going specifically into one location uh, with the sole purpose to reduce the uh, antithrombin. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. What considerations would you discuss with a patient considering a gene therapy trial? What questions should they ask themselves if they were considering participating? Sure, this is uh, Dr. Tran. So a couple of uh, important questions is to just make sure that uh, with any gene therapy trial, there's going to be a large time commitment, especially since there's a lot of unknowns uh, at this point in time. So a uh, couple of questions to make sure that you pay attention to is that um, if there are certain trials that you're interested in, um, I would reach out to the enrolling site to see what the timelines would be, um, because some of them can have pretty intense um, schedules where you're going to have to go to the hospital uh, or clinic in order to get those labs checked. Um, and other things uh, that you can potentially ask about as well is to see if there's any restrictions um, as far as what medications you can take or what medications you should not be taking uh, while on the drug as well. And this is Robert Sidonio. Uh, you know, all of these trials have specific things we call inclusion and exclusion criteria. And things like HIV uh, and hepatitis C are not typically uh, things that would exclude you um, from these clinical trials, uh, which is important for our older patients with hemophilia. Um, and if I remember correctly, um, the patients that were in the Unic Unicure trial, uh, the majority of the patients actually were positive for hepatitis C. Um, so all these have different uh, attributes and different things that allow you to participate in the trial. And as Dr. Tran um, mentioned, it's important to get the details on what the surveillance is um, because uh, these trials aren't going to be open at many centers. Um, and, and there is an ability to travel to a site. Like, for example, if you lived in Alabama, you would be able to travel to Atlanta to participate in a clinical trial, but you need to properly plan based on what the, um, how often you need to be seen afterwards. Um, and some of the gene therapy trials actually do allow you to get local labs uh, in the trial once you get past a certain critical period following the injection. Thank you. Uh, next question. For H910, how will treatment be planned for surgical procedures? What would the recommended treatment be for surgical procedures? So some of these trials, this is Dr. Sidonio again, um, they actually don't allow you to have a surgical procedure during the clinical trial. Um, so we found it important that if there is a likely need for a central line, that that be placed prior to the trial. And some of the trials, not all of them, uh, when you do have a surgery uh, or any procedure that requires a certain number of doses, that you actually would be removed from the trial. Uh, so this doesn't, these uh, trials don't have specific surgical arms. Obviously, the discretion for treatment is always with the local provider. That's not something that's regulated by the, uh, the clinical trial. So for example, if a patient was at our institution, Dr. Tran and I would make the decisions on the frequency, uh, how long to treat, and the dosing of uh, the bypassing agents needed uh, for that. So no therapies will be withheld or are regulated by uh, centrally by the uh, the clinical trials, but currently there are no surgical arms as you've seen in some trials, which would like to study that. Um, that's something that potentially may be done in the future. For right now, those are things that would actually disqualify you in, uh, while you're on the trial. Next question: uh, With moderate factor nine three percent clotting. Does trying new products increase the chances of an inhibitor? I'll, let, I'll defer to you, Dr. Tran. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? 
Definitely. Um, with moderate factor nine three percent clotting, does trying new products increase the chances of an inhibitor? I think uh, currently, if you are using a factor nine, are you talking about is the individual? So, if the individual is talking about trying different factor nine products that are currently available out there, um, with the moderate hemophilia patients uh, that I typically care for, you typically don't require that much uh, infusions. Now, if you, uh, so I guess the answer is, if you have not dosed that many doses and you have used less than, I think, studies of anywhere between 50 to 150 exposure days, if you're less than that, then you still have a higher likelihood of developing an inhibitor. Um, now, as far as switching, there's currently no evidence that have shown, you know, switching products um, will lead to uh, an inhibitor at this point in time. But I'm not sure if the individual is asking specifically about switching from clinical trial drugs or those that are available currently. This is uh, Dr. Sidonio, and, and there's currently, they're investigating uh, through a trial called Athen2, which is a switching trial, through, so American Thrombosis and Hemostasis Network is conducting sort of a real-world world trial in which we're enrolling patients that um, are switching to a new product, regardless of what that product is, um, whether it's a standard half-life product or a, a extended half-life product. And so far uh, in the study, they have not seen any inhibitor formation in patients that have not had an inhibitor in the past. But obviously, this is a discussion you would have with your provider. Um, like as Dr. Tran said, the risk is quite low, particularly if you've had significant number of exposures. And, um, but it's something that we need to follow uh, and, and conduct surveillance and check inhibitors at sub subsequent visits. Uh, we have another question that comes through. Um, pull it up here. Why are there such limited spots of, available for some of the trials? The pre preliminary results look so promising, yet in my case, the spots filled up before I could enroll. Uh, so this is uh, Dr. Sidonio. So um, you know, when they they have to when when they create a clinical trial, they have to come up with a, a reasonable number or what the expectations of how well the drug will do compared to what the standard of care is. And based on that, they create a sample size that's needed to show this F effect. A lot of this is regulated by uh, the government as well. They have to ensure that this was done appropriately. Um, and um, um, and, and there are certain centers that have larger numbers of patients, uh, and when these, uh, these companies are conducting the trials, they would prefer to go to centers that have had a, a significant experience with clinical trials. You have to have the proper infrastructure there to make sure the, the trial is safe. Uh, and so to do these trials, they tend to go to the larger centers or centers that have more patients uh, because it's cost effective to conduct these trials because uh, these trials can cost upwards of millions of dollars to conduct. Um, and um, so we don't, so what they want to do is make sure they can show that there is an appropriate effect with an appropriate sample size. Um, that way um, the trial doesn't go on for extended periods of time, thus, you know, not allowing patients to be uh, used this as once it becomes FDA approved. Um, but uh, as I alluded before, um, they tend to open them in certain regions, allowing patients to travel to be in these trials. And I know at our region, we are likely to enroll patients from neighboring states, from Alabama, Tennessee, and Florida. Uh, and we obviously would like to provide that to them. Um, the issue with the fast closure of the study was is that it enrolled so quickly and was so popular um, that they enrolled significantly faster than they thought they would. Uh, thus, the, the reason why it was temporarily held in some of them and also uh, closed to enrollment. So they were actually quite successful and were able to enroll significantly faster than they expected. So um, which hopefully will allow those patients uh, to study their effect over a long period of time and eventually make it to uh, market and allow the general population to get it uh, by your local provider.
So the one thing that I would cool. also add is that, uh, this is Dr. Tran, the other thing that I would also add is um, that there are several clinical trials um, that are available through clinicaltrials.gov that do not have uh, patients signing up for them as well. Um, there are certain trials that, you know, are much more exciting uh, than the others, but there are uh, a lot of other trials that may not get the enrollment as quickly, and um, so it's always worth exploring the clinicaltrials.gov on a daily basis, especially if you're someone interested in uh, getting involved with the uh, latest and greatest clinical trial that's available. We had another question that has come through. Um, for ACE 910, do they think they will apply for indications for inhibitors first, or will they wait to apply for both inhibitors and non-inhibitors? So this is Dr. Sidonio. So it'll depend on which trial completes first. Uh, currently, the way it's going, the inhibitor trial, uh, as I mentioned, 12 enolar is closed to enrollment. Um, and so uh, once that study has reached a certain endpoint and they had analysis and they published in a peer-reviewed journal, they will submit it to the FDA to be approved. The FDA will make the decision about what the specific indication is. And it's likely that it will be first available for patients with inhibitors, um, what likely with some caveats um, based on what, a, what the youngest patient is on that part. And then hopefully the other trials will soon follow and, and it'll expand the indications, hopefully to younger patients. Um, and then um, if it's possible and if it showed that it's safe uh, in non-inhibitor patients. But most likely it'll be approved first in inhibitor patients. Obviously that's where the biggest need is and, um, you know, likely we'll be able to use, use it how we feel appropriate at our local institution. But uh, at first the insurance approval will likely be through uh, inhibitor patients first. Great. Um, another question, uh, do you have any thoughts on pricing? How will they price relative to, huge, to the huge difference between cost of inhibitors and non? I'll let Dr. Tran take that one. So, uh, Dr. Tran, so, as, so I think first of all, um, the drugs that are currently in development, uh, once they have shown positive results, uh, depending on the frequency of how often it's going to be administered and uh, along with what other drugs will likely um, have the marketing and the financial departments of these companies pricing it uh, appropriately because, you know, if we're talking about a medication that is, for example, the ACE 910 that it's sub-Q and um, can be given only, you know, once a week or so. I think they're still trying to figure out how often it can be given. Um, but with that, they take all, the companies themselves will take all that into account, and then they will try to price it um, competitively uh, because they have, in, they have done other research projects that have not necessarily um, been successful, and so when you do have a product that is successful, then you try to make enough uh, profits in order to make up for those that were not so successful. Um, but at this point in time, there is no price guide or uh, pricing that has been even discussed or talked about right now. And, and a lot of us providers have discussed that we would hope that um, they would factor in um, the ability for all patients to be able to receive these products if they are FDA approved for inhibitor or non-inhibitor patients, uh, as we think it would have a wide benefit, particularly for our younger patients, in which we may be able to start very early in life uh, and limit the number of factor doses uh, or exposure. And even if there is an inhibitor development, um, it is possible that these products will make that not as concerning uh, and then also, uh, if you delay treatment till later in life, maybe we can reduce the, the inhibitor formation rate. So we we have we will continue to make sure that the companies understand that the importance of these drugs, and I think they'll obviously take into account 
uh, um, the number of patients that will be available for this, particularly the inhibitor and non-inhibitor patients. So if anyone has any more questions, please uh, go ahead and type those into the question box. We have just a, another moment or two. Again, in your control panel, um, please go ahead and type any questions that you have. All right. Okay, so I'm not seeing any more come through. Uh, oh, wait, I think we just got one more. Um, are there added risks that have tokenized but stop regular exposure due to ACE 910? If they need factor for breakthrough, bleeds will the inhibitor come back? So, um, you know, as part of the clinical trials, they're going to look at the inhibitor uh, tighter throughout the trial. So preliminary data from the previous patient as you remember, the original patients were Japanese gentlemen that were enrolled in the trial who are now multiple years um, um, uh, past the start date. And so what they've seen in the prelim data is that the inhibitor titers have not changed. And if anything, they might have gone down because of reduced exposure to factor. Uh, again, the purpose of these drugs would be not to, uh, to drive the inhibitor rate up or to reduce the inhibitor rate, but simply to bypass uh, that issue um, because uh, the current therapies that we have right now are not doing a good job of uh, in getting rid of the inhibitor. We are hoping that it won't matter that if a, a patient has an inhibitor and that these drugs uh, will work just as well as, as in those that don't have an inhibitor. It is likely that it won't be that great, uh, that sort of in that perfect scenario, um, but we know that um, when you're giving acute bleeding treatment, the recommendations are going to be to continue to use bypassing agents, particularly if you have uh, inhibitor titers uh, in excess of five or higher, uh, which most of the patients that will be enrolled in the study will have. So you'll continue to use those IV therapies for acute bleeds, but hopefully replacing the immune tolerance regimen or the maintenance therapy with uh, the weekly um, uh, MSCizumab or Fetuzerin uh, that can be given maybe as uh, infrequent as one, once a month. Okay. Well, again, thank you, Dr. Tran and Dr. Sidonio for uh, that uh, very insightful presentation. And thank you all for your many questions that have come through as well. Um, again, we, we have recorded this webinar, so it will be available um, on HFA social media and website um, in the next few days or so. So uh, please check back with us. Uh, we will be sending out an email as well to all that attended. Um, so again, thanks to, thanks to everyone for being on the webinar tonight. And again, uh, to our wonderful speakers, thank you.